All right, welcome back to the Pickle Dragon Unscripted. And as always, we have our friends, Malcolm. And I don't think, while he is a friend, I don't think Brian's done one of these with us before. This is my first one. But he's a good, he's a good chap. He's a good guy. So appreciate it. We're 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 very, very excited to have you on. Um, so thanks for having me. I I thanks for coming on, both of you. It's always Thank you. great to have you. Um uh, so last time, Ham and Nasser and I, we talked about building a villain, like the, the mm. building a, a well-rounded villain that has that has uh, uh, very uh, in-depth and and well-reasoned motivations, that giving that making them more than just a killing machine and that has to be stopped, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so this time we wanted to sit down, and this was actually something that Ham brought up. He's like, at some point we're going to have to talk about evil organizations or cults or thieves' guilds or assassins' guilds or what motivates uh, an individual to serve in a in a dark lord's army, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and because those are important questions, if if you're interested in more of an in depth uh or uh organic if you will world so such that you know people have personal motivations as to why they do things so we're going to talk about that and uh i and again we have malcolm the gentleman gm who is the professional dungeon master extraordinaire the standard yes <laughs> The gold, standard. The platinum standard. There you go. Not the Ethereum, yeah. the platinum. Because yeah. who uses Ethereum? Yeah. Um, and Brian of the bearded nerd, the media mogul. Uh, <laughs> Speaking yeah. about evil organizations. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to put it out, out, out there. And, and again, there are when we're talking about evil organizations, you know, we have, we're talking cults, which are, which are one of my personal favorites because, um, you know, dealing with or, or orchestrating the activities of crazy folk, um, are, are, is very entertaining to be as a DM. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but we could look at assassins guilds or evil armies, even thieves guilds to an extent. I don't know that, Thieves guilds necessarily have to be inherently evil, but they're sure. certainly a criminal organization. Um, so, Malcolm, what do you got? What do you think about this topic? It's a good one. I was almost going to say, Brian, go first on this one. But um, you know what? Um, I can't say that I, like, spend the most of my time trying to rationalize some of the organi organizations that I use in-game though I do try to humanize them. Um, I, I think that villains can be misguided, but, but evil doesn't need to make complete sense. Um, I find that what's typically most important in my games is not the, I, seem, I, 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 I used to kind of focus on the history of these organizations and why they do what they do, but I found that the party just cares about, it's really more about the way that group makes the party feel. Mm. Do they get vehemently angry when they hear that they've done something or they've made a move in the city? Do they pity, you know, the, the, this organization when they find out why they, but it's really about just trying to keep that, that feeling of who they are. It's similar to, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of everything Disney, but one of my favorite villains in that Marvel first arc was Thanos. And yeah. like Thanos is overall art for snapping half the universe doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you think about it. And he's not, I guess I'm getting more into villain territory, not organizations, but organizations can, you can kind of apply similar logic where, but when you start to kind of rationalize why this organization is doing what they're doing um, and you kind of, one thing about that character, the goal is not as, a little silly, but the, but the way the character's played you get behind and you believe why they want to do what they, you know, why they, so the book might say, you know, the, the, the evil cult of the dragons wants to raise Tiamat. Well, why? Like, why aren't they going to 
to be just as subjugated, you know, by her. So just trying to get, I, I just spend a lot of time trying to craft why the people believe this so well. And we could kind of go into that tangent on what that is and trying to convey that. I think one of the, one of the, you know, one of the organizations I've been having fun with right now in my game is the, uh, is the Castle Lanterns and their, um, their, their cult of Asmodeus in Waterdeep, because that's a, that's a fun one to, to play with. But it's really just getting behind the feeling of the organization and, mm. and conveying that more and keeping the history to myself, unless the players start asking those questions, because I usually plan all that stuff and they don't even ask those questions. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They just know what they Get feel the yeah. when they yeah. need them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's very difficult to uh, separate the organization from the hierarchy. Sure. Yes, um, it is. So in that, it's obviously we're going to probably be talking about um, the motivations of the leadership if you will, but it's, it's, I think it's a fair question to say, okay, we have this hierarchy who has, has their own motivations, but you know, why is, why is, you know, Fred Jenkins joining the organization and yeah. what are the, what are the, his, his motivation and how yeah. does, how did he end up in, in that position and, um, you know, uh, it's 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 a it's it's it can be it can get messy in so far as you could go down a, a rabbit hole like you said and and the players may never ask but I think that players can pick up when when the DM is just kind of like I got evil guy A and yeah, evil yeah. Guy B versus I've got Fred Jenkins and I've got, and here's why he's doing, and they may never hear here's why he's doing all of these terrible things. Um, but I think that they can sense that that GM or DM is prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I think I'd be interested. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear with you guys, how you approach that organization component, like, you know, in terms of why the followers join the cult, right. And why they, hmm. why they believe what they believe. Um, and how you convey that, you know, to your players. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, is, it is an interesting topic, you know, um, for sure. I utilize real world scenarios, right? So for example, when the Italian American, you know, when the Italian immigrants came to America and this country, like, obviously there was a lot of, there was racism towards them. There was a lot of, of you know, bull, you know, a lot of crazy things that happened to them as well. So what happened? They created organizations to protect each other. Hundred, you know, hundred years later, Italian mafia, right? The, the the Italian mafia is, you know, in all sorts of crime, and, and involved rather in so all sorts of crime. And I look at that as an example of how a organization would become evil. It's all about perspective. In in my homebrew game, I run it from a perspective, right? This organization does this, 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 and that. Does it make them evil? To your eyes, maybe. But to another group, it may not be evil. It may be, well, these people protect us. They ensure that no harm comes to us. Yes, they're a bit strict and they're a bit authoritative. Or, hey, you know, they may, you know, extort us for money and things like that. But I can run the street, you know, at whatever hour of the night and a bandit's not going to come and rob me and do worse. That's kind of how I run my evil quote unquote organizations. But also there's no good organizations in my world. There are some clear like, okay, they do a lot of good things or yeah, this group does a real, a lot of messed up or evil things, but it's all about perspective in my opinion. What might be good for you might not be good for them. And um, it might just be subjective at that point. Not that I'm saying that there is subjective truth. And that's more of a philosophical question. I'm saying more of like evil when it comes to dungeon masters running a world or game masters. Like consider using that perspective. Consider thinking of it from a, you know, why is this evil? What are Just like a villain, right? Is a villain is, th you know, let's use a Thanos example. Was Thanos really wrong about what he was saying? Maybe in one end, 
um, there was too much, there, you know, there's overpopulation, but like in the what if uh, animated series, instead of just trying to um, eliminate half the population, why don't you just double the resources, right? So there, that's where you come into, okay, this person's actions are probably not good, even though the intention may be good, they're not great because of what they're trying to do, you know, that parameter that you've set. And that's where the players set the parameter for the evil organization, at least in my opinion. And, I, and you know, when I first thought about this topic, I was like, I was kind of wishy-washy on this because mm. there have been a million arguments about alignment out mm. there. Um, so when yeah. you look at the evil alignment, um, I think that there is a lot of nuance when it comes to neutral evil, lawful evil, chaotic evil, not so much, but, um, I think chaotic evil is kind of something it's, it's like in a class of its own in, in, in a way, but, okay. uh, but what I always told my players is, you know, you could be neutral evil and, and in no way, shape or form be willing to resort to murder. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you might be willing to take a, a grandma off for her last cent or take the candy from a baby. Um, and you might be fine with that. Uh, you can clear your conscience of that, conscience of that, but you may not be willing to stick a knife in that baby to, to get its candy, you know? Yeah. Um, I just, and I, and I, and I, when I was thinking about this topic, I've, I'm almost, I'm like this shy of finishing a book series called The Black Company. And heard of it about a, about a mercenary company who is all kinds of shade of nuance and evil, and mm. they're definitely the heroes of the books. Um, it's something like 10 or 11 or 12 books long, I can't remember now. I'm on the last one, um, but you know, there, there's a character in that, that, that series, his name's One Eye, and he's kind of a uh, uh, a very minor sorcerer in the world. And there's no question that he is evil. Um, he does some terrible things to people in that book. But in, in, in terms of his organization, and he thinks, he definitely thinks of it as a brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, he is loyal to the end. You know, he would not, he would not do anything against a, a brother as he calls them. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he murders and he does some terrible things like to, to make sure people don't talk. You know, there's a, yeah. there's a, there's a part in the book where um, they had that they visited an inn and they didn't want anyone to know that they were there. So he went back to make sure that there were no witnesses, you know, and these just were some folk that gave them a night's rest. Yeah. Um, so a person like that, when you're talking about an evil organization, and the motivation of why would someone do that? You know, it's uh, from that perspective uh, of the black company, um, and, and we could replace black company with an Assassin's Guild or, uh, or uh, you know, a cult or anything else. You know, you could, you could say, you know, they built this, this bond of, of, of brotherhood or whatever, um, and and you know they are tight knit and they're willing they're willing to do things that maybe they wouldn't necessarily do under normal circumstances had they had they had their lives been in a different circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a very interesting thing. You know, um, have you ever, Malcolm? Have you ever used like uh, I and I would I would wager yes, but like. Um, a cult in your campaign. So, and, and I think a cult kind of stands apart from some of the other organizations that we could think of because it's it's generally associated with like demonic or infernal forces yeah. or some sort of, of, you know, dark God or whatever. Um, but, you know, the members of the cult, like my current campaign is, is, embroiled in a Thara's Dune cult. It's a, it's, and I've spent so much time thinking about uh, what these, what these guys are doing and why they're doing it. 
um, that I think I've actually kind of gotten lost in the weeds a little bit. But so I'd like to hear what you think of that. I mean, it's, it's very similar to what Brian said is I, I try to think of like what I've what I've experienced, what I've seen in like kind of real life and bringing just some of that inspiration in there. And, and I think with Colts, it's like, you know, while like, you know, a lot of the things, a lot of the stories we've seen from fanatical, you know, religion uh, that's kind of gone wrong and uh, the kind of uh, things that can happen when people get bought in and you kind of wonder and you, you know, you read or you watch documentary and you realize how someone could get kind of caught up and indoctrinated in something and that's just really the way I treat cultists whether they whether they worship like you know a high god or they worship demons or whatever it is or they believe they will need to resurrect something that they're all they all come from us you know like it's like Brian said there's a perspective of they had to come from some background there's something they need in their life and this yeah. thing provides it and it usually starts with this thing providing a sense of family a sense yeah. of somewhere to go to and my biggest litmus test against any organization in my world is the party because they are an organization and I often find they're pretty damn ruthless. Yep. And when you look at what they're willing to do, you can kind of lean a little bit on them and see and then, you know, start pitting some of their actions against some of the other actions that these, these criminals are doing in the world. And often, you know, you do it well enough and they start to go, well, I guess we've been pretty ruthless sometimes, you know, we, I mean, how many times their party, like they didn't necessarily kill someone. They killed someone who did wrong, but they showed like no mercy or they, yeah. they tend to, you know, they tend to escalate. I've noticed that not all my party, but a lot of my party members or my, my groups tend to escalate conflict instead of try to, they almost want it. And you wonder, well, is it the player that just wants to have the, the fun of the thrill? I'm not talking about murder hobos either, but I'm just talking about because at the point, once they start to get a little bit of power and they start to level yeah. up, when a guard or someone that they think is low level talks back to them, they respond like, "You do you want some? Do you want these hands?" Right, yeah. and you, you start <laughs> yeah. to realize, well, why wouldn't this organization, when they get a little bit of power, be the same way and start yep. throwing their weight around, right? And you, and that party is only five or six people, and they're always yep. throwing their weight around. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's because <laughs> it's the N, it's the PC versus the NPC. It's the video game mentality that a yes. lot of folks have, whereas. If you see any type of professional stream um, and, and, and you see the how they treat the NPCs, even with professional streams, they kind of use that authority of, you know, we are the hero, so listen to me, guard. And I've had, I've had that in my game before, and I've always posed this question, what is going to make you the hero if you keep acting that way? What is going to justify you? And therefore, you become your own. I mean, you said, and you said it perfectly, uh, Malcolm Ware. Why is the party not the evil, you know, organization? They could be viewed as it, right? They, what's stopping them from becoming evil? Especially, you know, I had a scenario where a couple of uh, party members wanted to go into a, you know, they want to pursue these goblins, right? The, the typical, you know, monster to beat up on. Yep. And I presented an opportunity and, you know, they, they were fighting the goblins and they were hacking and slashing. They loved it. Then when they got down to the last male, because that's what I kept on saying, there were a bunch of male goblins. Then they see all the female goblins and the kids like huddled up in the corner. And I presented the thing. Are you now evil? Because these goblins were just trying to protect their wives and their kids what makes you good and that really threw a monkey wrench in this group and I, I bring this up because again evil organizations what defines evil that's the first thing I think what we would have to say if if anyone takes anything from what I say what defines evil in your world yes is it because they do something evil or is it because they are intrinsically evil, right? I know devils and demons and things of that nature could be seen as intrinsically evil, but what? I mean, in reality, why are they intrinsically evil, right? Why, why, is, as, why is Asmodeus in your world the Lord of Nine Hells? Asmodeus could have just been a fallen god, yes. right? A la, a la Critical Role, you know, uh, Exandria Unlimited. Mm -hmm. Perfect concept. Your BBG, 
could be a fallen God who was betrayed and who was really blamed for everything. Um, kind of like how Hades is in, in Greek mythology, kind of just that it's the, you know, the, 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 the offshoot of the branch, so to speak, that no one really cares or loves, but someone has to do the job, right? It could be that, but that's where I would say, like, even with the evil villain, why is the villain evil? Why is the BBG, why are they considered bad? Right. Like, what, you know, what makes them bad? Is it because we said it was bad as Dungeon Masters? Or is it because their actions are bad? And that's sometimes what frustrates me about sometimes when we have these conversations, I hear a lot of people go, well, I don't like delving that deep because like sometimes I just want intrinsically bad, you know, races or whatever be like, why can't they just be bad? And I'm like, that's cool when you're like eight years old or you're 12 playing this game, and you just have like bad goblins. But like, especially for, for adults who we immerse ourselves in, so we relate it to history and we do all the stuff and we mm -hmm. really build these worlds out. And then suddenly we're just like, yeah, but these guys are just evil. And yeah do it, it doesn't make sense i mean if you want to add it in your game go for it yeah but go for it i'm not against it you just that, you know it doesn't work in mine but and that's the thing like okay a beholder why is a beholder again that maybe this is just because it's in my homebrew world not like the characteristic of a of a, of a beholder they are insane and you know quote insane um they're seen that way but in my world, it's because they, they're such a super intellectual being that they have no one to talk to. They have no one to relate to. So every time they've tried to relate to another beholder, that beholder is trying to stab them in the back, right? You know, I there's a lore behind it. There's a reason behind it. I think us as adults, we're not looking or rather we're seeking out deeper meanings in certain things, especially in our, you know, tabletop games. Yeah. So like you said, Malcolm, when, when someone just throws the random goblin encounter just because it's evil or the gnolls, right? I mean, gnolls, okay, you could probably get away with that a little bit more, you know, because just because just of the, in, you know, the, the way that they're portrayed and whatnot. But goblins could also be, I don't know. And I think actually, um, Matt, you said this the other, you, you said this on a post of mine regarding alignments and i remember you specifically we were talking about how based upon intellect right their intelligence score whatever you want to say that is what determines whether they have sentience or not right and then that's what determines whether they're evil or not evil because they can choose to be evil or they can choose to be good like i don't personally like the trope of every orc is evil that's just not my thing don't like it really i think you know, from a Lord of the, I think it works in Lord of the Rings because Tolkien explained the lore. You know, the elves were tortured and influenced, and then there, you know, there became orcs. But then orcs grew and grew and grew and started to procreate, and now you have the race of orcs. And they were bent under Sauron. That that's the that's the lore behind it. Okay, you accept it, but the lore can be whatever you want. Again, going back to all this, not trying to go into a tangent, um, but it's the same thing with evil organizations, right? The villain, you talked about hierarchy, that person may have an intention that's good, but they're doing it an, in an evil way. Um, and then it trickles down to the organization itself. They think that they're doing well. They have acceptance. They find family, like you stated. They find a reason, a purpose but they might be going about it the wrong way or they might have internal conflict. I don't know, but I think that's where you start. In my opinion, you start with that perspective and you start with the leadership, the hierarchy, right? Who's the BBG or the general or the, really best you, know, you know what I mean? Like it, it, and it trickles down from there. Great. I, uh, one of the things, my current campaign and at the risk of them, at the risk of the, my players watching this, um, there is the Thara's Dune is the main, uh, or the cult of Thara's Dune is the main topic, and mm -hmm. I gave an enormous, an enormous amount of thought as to um, mostly the motivations of Thara's Dune. So, in my world, Thara's Dune was one of the very first gods. So, in my world, fate and destiny, like 
where do the gods come from? Well, there are these two forces, fate and destiny, that actually started everything. Um, and they were the first ones to kind of spin off the sentience that was Thor or Odin or whatever. Nice. Um, Thar's Dune was one of those first first uh, sentience that, that spun off. And eventually the, these gods started to take physical form. Well, if, mm. you, are, if you were the very first um creature to actually uh, to take a physical shape and once you've taken that shape you're kind of stuck in that that mold um mistakes happen right so Thar's Dune assumed a form that happened to be physically and mentally uh torturous and that's kind of what drove him into madness and he's constantly mm. in agony, constantly and as one of the very first born um, he's also extremely powerful. Um, so when he decides, I can't take this anymore, I've got to just undo everything, and maybe I'll get a second chance. So he tries to undo everything. The gods gang up on him, and they're not able to kill him because he's so powerful. He's not able to kill himself because he's such a power that that he, he doesn't know how to do it. Um, that they... that. And they can't physically overcome him. So Loki tricks him into this prison. And that's how he ends up being the chained god. Um, mm. So he's stuck in this prison. He's going crazy. And he becomes the patron of madmen. And what better group? Uh, what, what group, you know, is more uh, kind of stigmified than, say, like schizophrenics and the mad and the sociopaths and the, yeah. and and so they gravitate towards this cult and they they want to see their god uh allowed to unmake the multiverse because then they'll be given a second chance too um and the party hasn't figured all the motivations out yet it's coming they've they've been given hints mm. um but uh you know in that in the face of that are they, I'm, I'm hoping that they're, because I have two things planned. I have plan A, which is the standard heroic thing. They're going to squash the cult and prevent him from being released from his prison. Um, but plan B would be to, for the party to figure out how uh, Thar's Dune could end his life. Um, yeah. So in a, in a way, they're helping the villain. It's different. It's a different twist on it. But I've, I've, I've thought about it so much that, that uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm afraid that, I'm afraid that, because I want plan B so bad, and I'm afraid I'm going to be so let down if they go to plan A, because likely, <laughs> it's very likely that's the direction they'll go. But I'm very lucky in that I've got a group of players who are, um, who are, uh, much more interested in backstory and mm -hmm. and digging a little deeper than I than a group because I'm new in New Orleans, so it's a brand new group, um, and they're they're much more interested in 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 you know s seeing what's below the surface without uh, before just you know sticking a knife in something as opposed to my old group. Sorry guys, it's true though you know it. Um, so, uh, and, and in terms of a cult, um, I, I think that, that it, it's all shades of gray. Everything's shades yeah, of gray. Very you true. Know, um, you know, you, anyone, like you said, Brian, uh, you know, you could argue that demons and devils, they're, they're soulless and they're, and they're bent on, on, you know, it's just their nature. Um, but, uh, you know, orcs, again... You know, if you if you take the Tolkien stance, you know that they were they were tortured, and, and that 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 idea of of suffering and and pain kind of carries through the generations, and it's and it becomes very difficult for them to break that from their children. And of course, Tolkien never really went into how orcs propagate themselves. You know, I think there was some talk because I know in the books they. They always talk about they were bred, you know, but what does that really yeah. mean? There's no talk of, you know, female orcs or mm -hmm. orc children or anything. But, um, you know, I, one of the things third edition did, 
and I can't remember what they're called anymore, but there was in a in an in an expansion, and I can't recall what it is. I know it was third edition. There was a race of orcs who were uh, you know, they had the big tusks and everything, but they were fancy boys, you know, they 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 dressed in nice clothes, they went to schools and and they were they were much more interested in poetry and and you know musical instruments because that's that was their culture and it was a special race of orcs and I can't remember what they're called right now and I'm sorry for that but third edition you can probably look it up <laughs> uh, and so it was like that was a cool way of adding a new twist on on the orcs um, without kind of stomping on the legacy of D and the and the and the traditional bad guy orcs that mm -hmm. so many people like to use but um i i my wife made one she made a guy named percival and uh nice. he was a he was a, a he, you know it, and it was just it, it's it i think it's um and i i think i've said this before to my players in a way, you can see alignment as cultural. So, like for us, for us, it's unconscionable. You know, like like there are people around the world who eat dogs. You know, and like that's just like there, there's festivals in China where they they you know they feast on dogs. And here I am fostering homeless dogs, and I like to me that's like the most abhorrent thing you can think of. You know, we eat beef are, every day in this place in the world where the you know, cow would be sacred. Yeah, yeah. exactly, that, right? exactly. So, um, you know, there there could be an evil organization that that is on the war path because we're eating cows. You know, <laughs> is, are they evil? Well, maybe to perspective us because we like hamburgers so much. But you know, to them, they they are righteous. Well, he here's a good example. It comes from my homebrew world. There is a place where none of my players have gone to yet, so I don't mind saying this. Um, they don't care about necromancy. They find it as a normal thing. On the contrary, the chief priest or priestess is a high-level necromancer practitioner, you know, on their way to lichdom. And it is as a person... Your, you understand that servitude to your community, to your people, to your nation doesn't stop when you're, you know, dead. dead. Yeah. You can, and the way they look at it is they have a, basically they have a utopia because the skeletons and the undead, all those are, you know, controlled, you know, by this, you know, lich essentially does the hard labor, goes to war does all the things that instead of, you know, killing thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, they're already dead. Yeah. So they're saving lives by actually using and raising of the undead. And it's kind of like, well, are you, it's kind of, it, are you actually doing good by just staying there? Or are you, you know, doing something bad by oh practicing necromancy no it's a there is perspective a in the scarred lands a city there's a city under siege in the scarred lands uh world setting that they started resorting to raising the dead and sending zombies out to fill the ranks um and i can't mm. and i can't remember what's called but it popped into my head and i know it's out there um but it's an interesting topic because when I was younger, necromancy, I always told my players, necromancy is, is a pure evil, you know, my 17-year-old self. Um, and that's the way we ran it back then. But it's a good, it's a good question, isn't it? Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of... Uh, one of the settings out there, Paizo, when they used to do Dungeon Magazine. Yep. Um, if you've ever, have you ever read The Savage Tide, either one of you? That I have not yet. Okay, Savage Tide, if you have a chance to read it. Um, 
It's one of my favorite campaigns. Um, and there's a city called Scuttle Cove. And Scuttle mm -hmm. Cove is like, uh, it is Moss Eisley on steroids, right? It is nice. the den of scum and evil, scum and villainy, or whatever they, whatever <laughs> Obi Wan said. Um, but there are a number. There's like five different evil organizations in that. And I was running my players through it. And I actually had a player quit. He's like, you know what? This is just too evil. This mm. is too much. You know, there was like one villain who was. Uh, he was uh, a wizard who was into the drug trade and he was putting out these magical drugs that were getting people horribly addicted and the streets were just filled with just junkies and it was horrific and then there were the slaves Damn. and there was the the flesh peddlers and the um, there was the pi there were it was a pirate cove so there were also the pirates who were bringing in fresh captives you know and it was just i mean it was and the party was supposed to go in there and kind of like under the under the um under the radar you know infiltrate these one of these groups and get something they needed um and and get out but the the these heroes kept getting themselves wrapped up like in all this plight and all these people that were suffering. And, and it was, it was very, it was as a DM, it was like, I could tell my players were uncomfortable, most, well, especially that fella, um, mm. you know, but it, there comes a point in time where uh, they did a very good job of writing that, that, uh, that setting. Yeah. If you're ever interested in checking it out, I, Dungeon Magazine, Savage Tide, it is incredible. It has elements of the Isle of Dread in it. You get to go to their version of the Isle of Dread. And oh, I think nice. it's usually called the Isle of Dread in it. Um, but it takes you from, from, from the, you know, low levels of kind of pirate holds and, and whatnot. Sasserine, this massive city, um, all the way into the depths of the abyss. Um, and it's, nice. It's it's in a it's a quite a ride, and it, it's the way it's split up. It's very easily like like pulled apart and just dipped into your campaign, like a little element here, a little element over there. A little plug and play. Yeah, um, because it's it's um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's very com compartmentalized very well. Isn't oh. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but it's. I actually used a piece of it in my current campaign, um, but it's it, it. There are moments in the Savage Tide where it gets downright hairy. Um, mm. So, so as as a DM, and obviously there's an element of you have to know your players. But even for the thickest skinned players, is there? You know, when I think about like what I was just explaining about the the Scuttle Cove. Is there what's too far, you know, even for the thickest player, thickest skin players? I've, uh, you know, I have, for example, speaking of organizations and underhand organizations, I have an NPC in my Theros world that I created, and he's a satyr, very flamboyant, dresses really well, named Barrelmon. Um, and he runs in these police, he, he runs a lot of the underground uh, gladiatorial fighting arenas that would not be sanctioned by the city. He runs in drug trade, but the party has gotten kind of buddy buddy with him because he helps him with information. Because you know, so they use this guy all the time. And then one day, the we used him, and the he gave the party a bag of pixie dust. Now, the way I use pixie dust, it's pretty much like cocaine in the world. So talk about going too far. And they we had an entire episode where they had a drug infused episode of using pixie dust, and then based on certain constitution saves and on a, a chart, it has, sometimes you do too much of it and it has bonus effects. Like sometimes they fly and sometimes, you know, you get extra strength. And so they had this entire episode like that where they were like, oh man, we got to hold on to this stuff. So they go back to him to get more of it. And he's like, well, actually my supply hasn't come in for weeks. I can tell you this, this forest is where my guys went. Can you go and check it out? And they're like, yeah, we'll go check it out because they want more of this stuff. And then they find this place. All the guys are dead because they've been killed by the god of Barica, the god of uh, poison for, for coming into her territory or by her followers. But what they do find 
is that the way they make this pixie dust is horrendous and they draw these pixies in and they murder them they pluck their wings so they can't fly and they grind them up and they turn them into this dust that everyone is snoring and so now they're horrified <laughs> now they're like this is how this is how this stuff is made and talk about going too far it's like now now this guy they got buddy buddy with that they knew did all they knew was kind of a bad villain now it's put in their face well you were using him he was he was cool until mm -hmm. now what now what you do you do do you do to him you know now what um how does that relationship change and so now they're like okay no this guy's a bad guy but then they're now the question is like does he know just because he works in the trade, does he know how the stuff is made, right? Exactly. Because like, they're thinking about just rushing into his place and murdering him. But they need to get some questions. Do they do they ask those questions, or do they just go on their idea of justice and kill some and create more bloodshed? You know. And it's just it's just that's what makes the game so interesting. When you have, I guess, as long as your players, you know, they know the the world that you're playing in, and you know. You've, you've had that conversation about what's too far. I usually have those conversations with them, but Same here. I'm not afraid to push them at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm not afraid to push my players at all. Um, I do, uh, Ray, AK, Got DM has coined this in his world evermore, where it's the rule of consent, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think most dungeon, most DMs or GMs that are worth their salt, they have a version of the rule of consent. It's just, you know, maybe different, but pretty much what I do, you have to consent to it. You, if, if, you know, I can go down the dark path. I've done it multiple times, but I had to have everyone's consent for it. I had to make sure that everyone was okay with it. Um, there are things that we pretty much say, okay, this is like, we fade to black. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then there are things where it's like a hell no, don't, you know, don't pass go, don't collect $200. Just, just, right. we just don't do it. Um, and obviously there are, because the thing is you can you can you can have a you can have a pokemon-esque rpg where everything is happy and bubbly and excited and everything is great or you can have game of thrones where everyone is getting pillaged and plundered and all this other stuff yeah. and it's just depending again what's the perspective what you know what are we trying what are you trying to accomplish here yeah that that's a big thing and i'd probably recommend that to dms veterans or not consider con, you know consider something of a consensual agreement to say hey you can go this way right You're like yeah everyone goes to the everyone jokes and laughs about the brothel mm -hmm. but if you think about it historically speaking and traditionally and you know currently most of the time people who are at least traditionally when you were in a brothel it was because you were widowed or you were in the slate in the in the sex trade mm -hmm. human trafficked all those things all these crazy horrendous things and then they end up in a brothel right you're and at it's the end of your rope huh you're at the end of your rope yeah yeah I, I i mean it's just you know you you have a lot there there's a lot of connotation behind it so when the players are like oh i want to go to the brothel <laughs> I'm just like, okay, like we can, we can, you know, role play and, and you can have a laugh, but do you realize that right. there's that connotation too? So yeah. I feel like there's a bit of a double standard and especially when it comes to alignments and then when it comes to evil organizations, what makes them evil? You know, why do you think they're evil when in reality you might be the villain, right? You, Malcolm, you talked about your, you spoke about your players, you know, now that they realize that, what was it the wings of the pixie that were being ground or the pixie themselves? The it, so the what I what they had later found out is that like in some cultures, you, some pixies when they get really old and they lose their flight, they can pick their they can use the the wings to make dust. But to have a drug culture like it is in this polis, to have as much of it, they're actually using the entire pixie. They're literally found a way alchemy to to use as much and not, and and these are also not consent these pixies are not using this for ceremonial this is pixies being trapped like you know yeah. like fishes and nets and being going through this long arduous ugly process to be turned into this stuff hand over fist so it's a little bit of both yeah gotcha so so there's like a cultural reference where like okay when pixies are older they no longer have the ability to fly they their wings will be removed 
And then, you know, that's more almost like a passing of the torch. But yes, in this case, it's like, no, they're being captured. They're being taken. Yeah, they're being they're being taken without their consent and their will. And and again, bringing up that situation where the players evil in supporting the drug business, so to speak. Right. Because how much time was it in game? Could have been days, weeks, months, years. You don't know. And they supported it. So what makes them different than the BBG or the the organization that they belong to? Right. Yeah, it's really. I don't know. I'm a stickler about perspective. I don't like to necessarily say that unless there is a God like, you know, Hestia, the God of home and hearth, like she's typically in my world. Good. Versus like, you know, a demon that's just wheeling and dealing and trying to just take souls. But but again, it's all about perspective. I'm always going to be the stickler that I, I feel like DMs and GMs really need to consider that, right? Nothing is necessarily evil and nothing's necessarily good. Everything, like you said, Matt, is gray or it can be gray. So what if, what if you have like a evil organization crown jewel that really just pulled your players in? What would that be? Mm, that's a good question. Like, are you saying what would be like the the thesis of this evil organization that would pull them to become evil? Or I'm thinking about like an example from your history as a DM, an organization that that you your players were just like emotionally invested in defeating. Okay, gotcha. So they there's one group that uh, wanted to fight the Duke and Duchess of Garceau. It was, um, they learned that they, they found out that they were part of a coven of vampires. Um, they did not, they did not learn the name of it because they had heard the rumors of these vampires just taking innocence, you know, uh, you know, whether it's, it was skewering their enemies or whether just, you know, the typical kind of like vampire lore. Again, myth and rumor. So they said, we got to do this. Like they are destroying these people. Like the lot, you know, these, these humans are, you know, not only depressed and, and, but they're emaciated from not eating all this crazy stuff. And when they finally, you know, destroy the Duke and Duchess, a bigger evil comes and it's, and basically it was, it was a bit of a mind, uh, uh, it was a bit of a mind screw with my players because what they didn't realize is that all that was rumor. When they get to the town, it's like, oh, these people are kind of normal. They don't look bad. And then, oh, wait a minute. Like, yeah, they're evil. They're vampires. They are They are taking innocence. But when the other big evil, the leader of the coven, basically comes over and under, and sees that they've been destroyed they release an even bigger evil. So it kind of just like on one end, it makes them think, damn, we just unleashed a bigger evil. But then that vamp, that vampiric, like we are taking innocence in order to survive and go forward. That really just made them like, hell no. And, and they, they're a messed up groove of players. Like they'll tell, <laughs> they'll tell you themselves. We're like, dude, we, we're messed up. Um, and it got them to say, no, we're not doing this. Like, we're not going to tolerate vampires stealing innocence, especially like kids. And no, we're not, we're, we, that's where they, that's where they put their foot down as adventurers mm-hmm. is no vampires n- things. It, and I, what I noticed it was kids when I met, and that's where rule of consent, y'all rule of consent. When I mentioned that they were taking innocent children, they were like, hell no. Anything that takes in, that does anything to innocent children, no, we're not playing with that. And and that's what motivated them. And again, y'all said it, finding the motivation. That was their motivation to say, nope, this is too, this is evil. You know, and, and that's an interesting one because I wonder, I don't want to get off topic, but that makes me think of when we talk about like Wizards of the Coast and what they've been publishing recently and mm. go back to the Tracy Hickman, like, and I and I like I said when I ran Curse of Strahd, I learned a big lesson because I ran that module and there's a lot of awful things being done to children. 
yeah. in that story. Mm-hmm. And, and now I realize whenever I run it, I have that conversation with everyone. But um, and I believe in definitely having the the, the consent conversation. Yeah. But our do you feel are a lot like I guess we a lot of you run you you run homebrew world. So for us, those of us that do use modules, have modules kind of gotten watered down? Is it is it better to have a module that's kind of dark where you can take that part out? Or does it does it feel weird to have to be a DM to like kind of to put the darkness in it? <laughs> you know, where I feel like there was that that module is one of my favorites, Curse of Straw, because you know, there's some really dark, interesting things that's to say about society and everything in this little what most people play is a can't be blah, I want to suck your blood, you know, but it's a really very dark written. That's the original movie. curse of Strahd, correct? The the, the original curse of Strahd and then the yeah, the 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 module, the 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 five E. That's what I meant. Sorry, the five E yes. original. Five okay, because yes. because I know they did the the curse of the Ravenloft revamp for fifth edition, which you know I heard some of the reasons, and I think I don't know. I I think there's a line that we cross, right? Wizards of the Coast needs to at the end of the day they are uh, subservient to their shareholders. If Absolutely. their shareholders say that we you know hey you're going too dark you got to change it up. They have to do that. You know, if, if, you know, some analyst at Wizards of the Coast or Hasbro or whatever is saying, Hey, we're getting, you know, our marketing data is saying that there is, this is too dark and, you know, clients, customers are are purchasing things that are not like this. Change it up. You know, they're going to do that. Is it right? No, they're running a business. But as a done, and that's, you know, something that I think we were talking about a little bit earlier between the difference between Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons is that Dungeons and Dragons gives you the, the primary colors, right? Blue, green, red, so on and so forth. Um, or blue, yellow, you know, red. If you want to make yellow, if you want to make green, you got to combine blue and yellow. If you, you want to make purple, you know, so on and so forth. Right. Versus Pathfinder gives you maybe a couple of colors, maybe two or three, but they give you every shade of it. Mm-hmm. So you can go as dark as you want. You can go as in-depth as you want. You can mm-hmm. become so, you know, you could become lost in the minutia that it doesn't matter. Right. And I think that's the difference. I think that we as dungeon masters, especially like home brewers, we will take what we want from a module and just add it into our world. Yeah. If it's not there, if it's there, we're still going to probably alter it. So I think it's even better. I think it's better to just keep it at this playing field. And if anything, maybe what wizards of the coast can do is release kind of like how they do for board games, release like an adult version or a more, a mature audience rating version, right? You know, the card cards against humanity, that's a great example where they have extreme mature, not safe for work version versus like, you know, apples to apples, right. You know, you know right. things of right. that nature. So right. I think right. that could be a good medium where they release a more adult content, adult oriented game that you can just literally plug and play into your, into that module. But that's just me. Oh yeah. That's, that's a, that's a take on it. You know, I, I, I think it's a good question or a good topic that you brought up. And I mean, you know, they Wizards of the Coast for whatever reason, and we can speculate all day long what the what the reason is. Sure. Um, but they re revamped Ravenloft. Now, in my opinion, Ravenloft was probably the most popular of all mm-hmm. of the published adventures that they put out people went nuts for it um yeah the fact that they felt the need to republish it i think i i don't know uh i don't know their motivation but um given their last say four releases like candle keep and you know strixhaven and all those i didn't like them myself i felt like they were very very watered down um, and in some cases poorly written and sorry, Watsy, that's just my <laughs> opinion. Um, but, uh, you know, Strixhaven, 
and uh, what was the other one? The was it the the witch light one? Mm -hmm. Felt like it was oh yeah for yeah. kids. Yeah, and, they, and maybe they're trying to pull, you know build a foundation there with some kids who are going to grow into some older material. Um, but I I kind of feel like they phoned it in in the last several releases. You know, multiverse was just a collection of reprinted stuff put together, yeah. uh, which I was disappointed with. I didn't even buy it. No, I was it either. Um, I want to. I would rather buy. There's a couple of books I want to. I would rather buy Taldora Reborn. I have the original one, but I just I would like to buy that. Yeah. And I would honestly like to buy more Paizo books or some of these more indie. Like, there's one book. It's like I forget what it's called, but it's a spaghetti fantasy set in Italian lore. I'd rather buy that just because it's some of the stuff that's been coming out. I bought Fizz Bands last, and it's good. I actually liked Fizz Bands a little for the most part. I liked it, but I like those books versus setting books because I always have, a, I'm always a little disappointed in a setting. Like there's always something that I want, like, I'm glad that they're bringing Dragonlance. I'm really happy about it. Mm -hmm. But I, and this is going to, you know, we can talk about it. This is where, I'd love to hear your opinions on it, but we've been in Forgotten Realms for so long. Yeah, I'm glad that Spelljammer's coming out. It's about damn time. It's wow. about damn time that we come out with Dragonlance. You know, now Dark Sun, that's the next thing. I don't think Dark Sun's ever going to be released or, re or rewritten for 5th edition. I don't think so. Yeah. It was a good setting. to. It's a good setting to talk about in this episode, and that's why I bring it up. Because it talks about slavery and it's part of the culture. So is that necessary? Is that evil? My opinion, I think that's evil. Yeah. Is that going to cause conflict and inner party conflict? Poss possibly. Yeah. Or that's where the party, and that's where I kind of view Dark Sun in a fifth edition setting, talking about evil organizations and evil villains and whatnot. You can always, that would be a perfect opportunity for the heroes motivation to band together to fight a culture and a people and a government or whatever that allows that to happen and then that's what you have so that would be a really cool setting to do that but again the motive it but that's where you go now more video game right that's where dark zone would be a better D, D video game because you have a primary goal which is to defeat that but again that's just me right yeah, I, um, I, uh, I didn't like fizz bands much, and maybe mm. it, and it's just my personal opinion. I took a look through it, and you know, like they had a generic draconian in there, for example, and I'm like, right. how much harder is it just to like, you know, upgrade the traditional draconian, especially if you're planning on doing Dragonlance? Now, my yeah. personal feeling is is that these last several books have been kind of phoned in, in my opinion, um, because they, they're putting all their effort into a 5.5 or, or a sixth edition or whatever they've got coming yeah. down the wings. And I think that's what we're going to see Dragonlance for. I don't think we're going to see it for the 5e as we know it right now. Um, Makes sense. My, my guess. Um, that's going to be, I am going to cry a little bit because uh, the amount of money that we've invested is going to, it, I think it's going to be a real, a real kick in the head, as they say, if we go sixth edition. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see. You know, five E is so popular. You know, yeah. I, I've there's a game store in New Orleans. They didn't have a D and D night. I told them I would try to get one going for them. And last night we were up to four DMs. We've got tons of players. It's been only just a little over a month, so the the desire to play has been yeah. there. And now we've got a packed hall every every Monday night. Um, the the so when when five E comes out or six sixth edition or five point five as my friend Kelsey calls it, um, <laughs> yeah, I I'm I'm interested in seeing how many people are going to be willing to make that jump, um, because. A large part of the popularity of 5e is it's been its simplicity, its its ease of entry. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so you have a lot of casual players coming in 
and as players and just kind of like they got their player's handbook and that's they might buy a miniature for their miniature for their character but that's about it you know right. yeah and um you know are are they going to retain those those customers um well we're talking about evil organizations and watsy keeps coming up i'm just, I'm just kidding kidding speaking of evil organizations not bad <laughs> jokes <laughs> Uh, oh. but, um, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I, I don't know, um, uh, I don't know what kind of impact that's going to have. And I, and I'm wondering if that's the, why they're hedging to 5.5, 5, mm. um, so that they can say, well, it's, everything's compatible. Cause that's what I've heard. Like everything's going to be compatible. Um, and, and of course it's all rumor, it's all speculation, but, uh, you know, I think we've gotten kind of off the topic, but I, I like this. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. I, like I did it. that. Uh, you know, the the if it all is compatible, and you know, who cares? Then then there's no reason to, to make a change. But um, I know that that we've seen a huge resurgence in the last few years of older editions. Like I haven't, I can't believe how many second edition groups I've found. Yeah, um, yeah true. And, and and to them, they're like, uh, you know, they're like, well, five E is just too. It's too simple, and three point five is too crunchy. Uh, so they went to second edition, which has the splat books, which is like player player options out the wazoo. Right. Uh, yeah. I got uh, all mine right there. <laughs> Just saying. But um, you don't have to use it. The DM can say, eh, no, no splat books. We're going to, you know, and and it, and it, ha it has its element of deadliness. Although I've never had a problem with 5e being deadly. Um, no, never. I think 5e can be extremely deadly. It's just, it's just you know, I know that, that 5e has gotten the reputation of being like Marvel superheroes for D and D, um, you know, virtually every class can cast a spell, and you know, and as they advance in levels, they all they, they all seem to have their own self heals and and whatnot. And that's fine. As a DM, you just have to you have to adjust. Oh, there's no cat meowing. You hear that? Yeah, I heard it, but I don't have a cat, so it wasn't <laughs> right. I don't have a cat. Yeah, I heard yeah. it though. My cat's my cat's been dead for a while, so maybe this oh is necromant. <gasps> All right, guys, I gotta go. But anyway, um, so I don't know um, what. How would how would as you as a professional DM? And I'm off topic, but I'm interested. As a professional DM, how would five point five or a sixth edition impact you? That's actually that's a good question. Um, I expect with Watsy buying D and D Beyond, the there would be a big push to like, this is an easy way to just transfer everything right over and make it easy. I, I don't like you said with everything kind of being compatible. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference. To be honest, I, I think there might be a few growing pains. If I think with some of my players, I noticed that well since I am a paid DM, what I can say is that my players do gravitate towards new books and they like all that stuff and they want to use. So for example, all the gripes I had with Tasha's, I say yes, because I, I want them to play the characters they want to play. And I want them to have that, that set up. So I typically don't have, I have a few rules, but, but usually, um, you know, the way I look at it is, uh, is it's, it shouldn't change too much, you know, um, because from the way I run the game as it is, right? And yeah. my players are, sometimes I do feel like I'm playing with a bunch of, uh, um, and don't get me wrong, they get very invested in their role play. These, I have characters who are constantly in between, like role playing in between games, writing personal vignettes of their back. I mean, personal, how they're, how they're feeling in between games and sharing it with the party. So they really get into it. But um, what was I going to say about that? But like, uh, at the same time, I feel like they do come in my games. A lot of times, they come across like Marvel superheroes. So, like they, I do have that that issue, and I do I can, and I know when I can make an encounter difficult. But then uh, there's often times where you know 
Uh, I do want them to feel super heroic, but I'm still sitting there like, yeah, you just did, okay, 34 damage, yep, that thing's gonna die, you know, and then that thing's gonna die, and then that thing's gonna die. So there are those moments, but I, I used to think of it as like, I think how you, I, I would love to hear how you all make your encounters more deadly and fun to be potentially deadly. Um, but for me, it's usually allowing them to feel powerful and let dread build over time and then drop yeah. the hammer, drop the, the, the hardest thing. And then I'd rather them be like, wait, what is this? Like, why, you know, yeah. and this is not in the, this is not in the monster manual. Right. Um, and, and then they kind of scramble, you know, um, but uh, I don't know if it's going to affect things much, you know, to, to be honest, because I think with D&D Beyond and everything, I think it's going to be pretty streamlined and it's going to be an easy I think it'll be easy transfer to jump. I don't think a whole lot's going to change, like, you know. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm completely wrong. Mm. It feels like, right now, it feels like right before they released fourth edition. Um, mm. At the close of third edition, they pulled the rug out from under Paizo. They pulled mm. Dragon Magazine, Dungeon Magazine from them. They started, they pulled the rug out from under Code Monkey, who was doing, it was back then, it was eTools. It was their version of D&D Beyond. And they pulled the license from them and they, they took all their toys home, you know. They consolidated. Yeah. yeah. And, and then fourth edition was announced right after that. And mm. um, so it kind of feels like that a little bit, just a little bit. Um, but... I'll be interested in seeing. I, I am like you, Brian. I'm interested in some new books that are that have come out. The One Ring, second edition from Free League. Yeah, I'm all of that. I'm very. I really like I it. I love everything Free League. I do too. It's Alien my, RPG. That's is, my go-to. Is if I could my side honestly side. get my players to play games, it would all be Free League games. To be honest. Yes. Yes. Um, I agree completely. And uh, but I. Uh, uh, so I'm interested in seeing how 6th edition or 5.5 or whatever they have come out with. Um, I, I, I would love to love, and I hope it does well. I, I love Dungeons and Dragons, and I want to see it go continue. Sure. I want to see it. I want to see it prosper. Uh, but I also want to see a game that challenges my players, challenges me. For sure. You know, right. When you like, for me, from my perspective, um, my players seem to be the most fulfilled when they pull victory from the jaws of defeat. You know, like uh, when they think that they are going to lose big um, and they manage to squeak one out. um, That's when I see my players are like, oh, you know, so they're like. You know, they they wander, they get up, and they have to walk off that tension, and yeah. and they're laughing and they're smiling, you know, and they 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 won the day, um, yeah. which we've had a few of those recently. Um, that's when I've always felt like uh, my players have been the happiest. And so when it comes to like encounter design, that's a really really awesome topic that that we can talk about sometime. That's definitely one I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, right. for sure. We'll do that one next. We got a big night. fight coming up on Thursday that I'm you know planning out, trying to make it the most <laughs> epic it could I, possibly be. I so. have, I have, I have a system for planning encounters. Like, and I'm, when I'm talking about when I use this system, it's always like, you know, this is the close of a chapter of the, mm. our, our story arc, mm-hmm. or, um, uh, um. Uh, you know, it has to be impactful in, in so far as, uh, you know, there's a lot on the line and it can't be, it can't be, a, it can't fall on its face. It has to feel like a lot's on the line, you know. So I've got a system for that. And uh, yeah, we can sh- definitely share that. I would love to, yeah. That would be uh, fun. Uh, yeah. Well, I have two types of groups typically. And there's like one that is very, they, they're kind of old school in the matter. They like plan D&D and they like the strategic fights and, and they don't role, they don't like, you know, do voices and stuff as much. And then I've got like several groups who are definitely grew up as like, they're, they're kind of critters at heart. And so they are role players through and through, you know, yeah. they, they, 
they show up, they are their characters and they really, and so a lot of even the most, I have found that for them, the hardest tactical encounters aren't as intense as um, making them make really tough decisions um, in game and, and the decisions that they make drive the situation to put them in. And that tends to make them kind of like way heavy on where they feel and where they're at. And, you know, I mean, I kind of have a party right now where they've just, they're like, the, I can, you know, can watch them all talking in their chat and they're like, what have we done? Like, we're, cause they're all kind of, they've kind of made a deal with some devils now, mm -hmm. but they realized they had to dig the deal with the devils because the, the devil's actually an enemy of a, of another enemy they actually want to kill. And they actually made the deal to save some children. It goes, it goes back to children. The children were the line. So they decided to make a deal with the devil yeah. to save some kids, right? But now they like are hurting. Like they're like, oh, and then they're wondering how they got to this place of dealing with devils in the first place. And the devil's are like, well, remember when you killed that guy? Remember when you did that? <laughs> remember when you did that? You know, and it's like all these things that they never saw were dark things that the devils were in saw their actions and entertained you know, entertain them long ago, you know. Oh, by that's brilliant because the players wouldn't think, oh, yeah, I'm going to slaughter these gnolls. Yeah. But by slaughtering them, now you've allowed, you've allowed evil spirits, let's just say, to enter the, in. The devils went, oh, you guys are capable of brutality that I need. Yes, you're the, you're the, you're the people for the job. You know? I'm going to, I'm going to funnel, <laughs> I'm going to use you to funnel my whatever. Yeah. I like it. It's interesting. That kind of stuff. Yeah. That is good. But, well, I think we're good. I think uh, this was an yeah. interesting co conversation. I really appreciate you always, Malcolm and uh, Brian. Thanks, I'm really glad you made on one. You're a, you are a busy new father. So I appreciate you taking yes. the time to, to uh, away from your family to sit down and talk to us. It's, it's always well, I appreciate y'all being patient with me and letting me come over and hang out. Uh, you know, thankfully, there's not a seven month old uh, in the background trying to <laughs> divine intervention, because now she is the deity of the house. So you know, yes, it is yes. what it is. Yes, absolutely. And that's coming up for me next in December. So Congratulations. Me. Yeah, thanks, man. So a lot of a lot of my DD schedule is about to change to some degree as well. It's also why I've been oh, yeah. a little bit slower on what I've been doing, trying to it takes a lot out of you. Change it. Changing. Yeah. Can you it? Exciting. It's exciting, right? My my youngest just turned 20. Wow. That's awesome. So we we need to come to you so that yes. we know and learn how to be fathers and balanced D. &D. And balanced dungeon masters. Yes. I'll be picking your brain, Matt. Uh, you just need that. an excuse to come to New Orleans. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> mm, business trip. Yes. There you go. Check that one off. That's right. And Brian, I hope to see you more on these. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. No, I'm excited to come on these and and hang out again. I appreciate the opportunity, y'all. I really do. I hope you get to come on some time on a Saturday morning and meet Hans Those are good. And Master. They're they're good guys. They I miss Nasser. I miss talking to them. Yeah. They have a lot of great insights. Um and uh, but they're in the Middle East. So, you know, Saturday morning kind of is, is it, it's Saturday night for them. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, you know, so it, it kind of, that's like the one time that kind of works for everybody. But, uh, well, everyone that's free then, you know. True. But, uh, and sa by Saturday morning, I think we've been doing like 11 a.m. Central to noon Central in there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But yeah, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming on. Malcolm, always it's a pleasure. Um, and uh, we'll we'll leave it then to Little Miss War Mistress then. So take it away. Mm -hmm. If you like what we do here on the channel, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell because it really helps us out. <laughs>